Radio Show with your host, Bonnie Clark. We stand together and accept that we now live in a world transformed by Fukushima. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on UCY.TV Radio. We relentlessly engage every ear that listens. We expose and confront the complete lack of accountability for the nuclear industry. Consider social engineering programs who view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. The Age of Vision Radio Show creates a venue that all will choose. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action and save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Our actions matter. Every voice matters. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today is Monday, August 1st. I can't believe that we're the, the it's racing right past us. The year is just racing right past us. Uh, shockingly, we have had events this year that I, I honestly would never have believed could have happened in the United States of America. And that is namely election fraud is just being ignored. I mean, straight up ignored. And all the while, we have our country in a complete state of disarray. Physically, emotionally, mentally, we are one seriously battered nation. And we continue to get pummeled. Like I've said before, there really is no battered country shelter to go to. So we've got to figure a way out of it on our own. As you know, on Mondays, I uh, interview people from St. Louis. I really expose the plight of the people of St. Louis on Monday. Um, I have been making attempts to getting people to interview with me on Monday. There are very few people now willing to come on the radio. I think it has to do with the sentiment that has grown in St. Louis, that outsiders are there really just to take advantage of the system and of the situation and make their situation better. Uh, For example, in our case, I have heard that people think that we're just trying to make our radio show more, uh, our radio station more popular by using their plight. I I understand that sentiment. Um, That is not what the intention is here. You know, it would be really awesome if our radio show would become super famous because we keep talking about the plight of St. Louis, but frankly, part of the reason why our radio show will not really get picked up uh, worldwide by any major stations is that we talk about the nuclear problems, the real nuclear problems, the real problems facing real Americans. And when I said that St. Louis is us, When I found out that St. Louis was happening, at a gut level, I recognized that that is really us all over the place. So, true to form this morning, there is nobody to interview. I had scheduled Larry Bergen. Uh, He had a bit of an emergency. He had to go get medicine. That's an emergency for someone who is suffering. So, uh, I rescheduled him from two weeks from now. So, today, I... Sort of thinking on my feet, there is a lot I'd like to share with you, so I am going to still talk about the St. Louis issues. And uh, I just went to Coldwater Creek, just the facts, please, Facebook page. Somebody posted there, this is what the people they're suffering are suffering with. I won't name names, but someone named, put this there, July 20th. I lived near Coldwater Creek for only four years when I was very young. 
I suffer from symptoms of autoimmune inner ear disease, which causes extreme dizziness, vertigo, hearing loss, and many other symptoms. I also have osteoarthritis and problems with my digestive system. Does anyone know how long you would need to live near the creek for your body to be affected from nuclear waste exposure? We were there from 73 to 77. I can, I can remember we used to have problems in our basement flooding. I am wondering if there is a cause to all these problems. Now, Kim Thestone, Kim Thone Vicentine, I always say her name right, she is one of the leaders of the... Westlake Landfill, Coldwater Creek people. Uh, she's, I don't, I know she came and talked on our show. Uh, she called in about something, but I think she's got some type of a scientific degree. So she responded, and I'm not going to read about other people's responses, but this is what she says. Stace, exposure is a funny thing. What affects one person biologically may not affect another. Coupled with exposure coupled with exposure is your genetic disposition to certain ailments which is different in everyone. The more you are exposed to radiation the more likely you are to long-term illness and effects from that exposure. We know that our exposure to radiation must be internal which means it would have had to been ingested or inhaled. External exposure from touching the rad material in our area will not cause long-term harm such as cancer. A good comparison for our radiation exposure would be to compare our community to the people who get x-rays. If you get an x-ray every day of your life you have a higher probability of contracting cancer than someone who never had an x-ray. If you have a history of cancer in your family that the probability is even greater. Our radiation exposure works in a similar fashion. We were chronically exposed to low-level ionizing radiation. It's the chronic part that has caused health concerns. And I'm going to stop here. I'm going to say they were not were chronically exposed. They are chronically exposed. We do not, we do not know that children and women are more susceptible to exposure. That is actually not a fact. It's funny how John Goffman's work has just been uh, ignored. John Goffman and Arthur, uh, Arthur Tamplin, Lin Linus Pauling won a, uh, a Nobel Peace Prize proving that that very fact is true, that women and children are more susceptible to exposure. That's why John Kennedy wanted to shut this down. If you, I'll back to what Kim said. If you grew up playing in the creek or in the ball fields next to Laddie Avenue as a child and were outside every day, your exposure and probability of contracting cancer would be much higher than a middle-aged male who never goes outside. That's why we can never confirm that one individual cancer is specifically caused by radiation in the creek. That is the nuclear lie. One, uh, that's my comment, the nuclear lie. I'm just going to tell I can't help but inject here because these are scientific people who are really buying the nuclear lies. Maybe that's why people don't want to come onto my show because I cannot just abide with them parroting what was said because that is not true. John Goffman has a whole freaking book about the exposure of low-level radiation and the cause to human health. And specifically, it specifically says that women and children are much more exposure to health, to exposure. Much more susceptible to exposure. Wow. In similar populations where the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, RECA, is in effect, the legal minimum is two years in a contaminated community. Further exposed residents in these communities must have one of 21 cancers that can be identified in the federal government as linked to the radiation exposure. I'm sorry I don't have a short answer for you, but I hope this helps explain it. Our groups, this is good, our group's ultimate goal is to become a federally recognized community. That receives benefits from the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, the RECA, R E C A. That's the act you just talked about. We are also pushing health awareness in both former current residents of North County as well as healthcare providers. Knowledge is the first step into being diligent about your health and asking for cancer screening. Our hopes is that cancer screenings will lead to early intervention instead of terminal diagnosis in our hometown. Now that is such a sad fact, folks, that that is how these people, this is their, this is how they have to live. So 
Kim also is responding about radio radioactive particles going down the drain. It says, yes, Tony, the dust is one of the exposure pathways. Keep in mind that the original piles of contamination have been gone for decades, so the creek itself is no longer contaminated because it was just fast moving or the sediment that was originally in the middle of the creek. The biggest contamination in the areas where the, flood, the creek flooded and pushed sediment into the floodplain. Wow. Over years, weather, rain, and snow have pushed contamination so contaminated the soil six inches to six feet down into the ground. So the peak of exposure would have been before this erosion occurred. We have also confirmed that in the 1950s and 60s, the events, the event contaminated creek settlement that was used as a housing fill dirt. Over the years, this would have been pushed down into the soil by the weather. But if you were a child living in the area when the housing developments were in progress, you would have been at the peak of exposure. Wow. So this is really stunning. They, you know, Kim Thone Vicentine lost her six-year-old son to a brain tumor. Um, from This is what she says. Uh, Considering I lost my six-year-old son to a brain tumor from my exposure, perhaps you don't realize that we started this group page in 2011 to raise awareness and to encourage cleanup. You may not be aware that until we created our health survey, there were no plans to ever test or clean up north of 270. The ATSDR was never involved in conducting a public health assessment, and 90% of St. Louis had no idea of the contamination spread. So before they started this group in 2011, this is the facts, folks. Did you know that we that as admin we are 100% volunteers who grew up in North County and have all been affected by cancer and have watched a loved one die? So by all means, please explain how I am blaming the public. That somebody she was responding to someone saying you're blaming the public for uh, doing this. You might also want to know that the original contamination that there was put there by Malincrot, not Monsanto. And Monsanto has nothing to do with our site. So this is this is the kind of anxiety that the people in, in uh, St. Louis have to live with. Knowing that only because of a Facebook page. A Facebook page, folks. A Facebook page. Do we get that? A Facebook page brought this to light. Not because of the EPA. Not because of anything our government did or was concerned about or anything so when these when people in st louis are a little bit leery about my radio show and about me disagreeing with their conflicts like just now her saying we don't know it's been tested about from men and women i understand their their concerns about not wanting to talk to me they're sick of people coming in and telling them what to do and what's right and what's not right i completely get that I don't know how they could live there. I and, and maybe that's another reason why they not so has not so encouraging to come on my radio show. I look at them and think, I personally would get in my car and live on the other side of town. Come back home and shower, shave, change my clothes, and stay out of my house as much as possible. I would not sleep in my house if I lived there. If I had discovered that since 2011, but I don't live there. I'm making these decisions from the comfort of living in Oregon. So I completely understand this. So I am going to go back to the Facebook page and continue to read uh, the continuing dialogue where Kim is responding to this. There's a person on here who is somewhat argumentative with Kim about blaming who's who. And this guy's saying, folks tend to come, folks, this is what I hate about that word. Thanks, Mr. Obama. Folks tend to come to conclusions based on their emotions rather than scientific exposure effect data. Well, the fact is we don't have any data, dumbass, Mr. Whoever you are. I'm not going to name you. I mean, really? Okay, this is what Kim said, and this is why my hat is off to Kim Thone Vicentine. She's one of the administrators of Coldwater Creek, just the facts, please. Because she has a calm head and a clear mind, and she is living there and fighting the good fight. And she has lost a child. She has lost the worst. So I have ultimate respect for her. And 
I really, honestly, I've gone through emotions on this radio show about, uh, you know, people not wanting to come on here to talk, and it's taken me a while to really comprehend the level of anxiety that people in St. Louis are living with. To the point where they don't want to be on this radio show because they don't want us, they don't want to look like they're ridiculing the government. Because guess what? They know the government is the only people that have the money to help them fix this. And if they come onto a show that's anti nuclear, that says unequivocally that nuclear is uh, the worst thing that ever happened and is a failed experiment, and that the government is lying to us and not telling us the facts, and that most of the EPA is completely incompetent and, in fact, is intent on killing us, and we are assets on a balance sheet, and they're just going to count heads and figure out who died of what and what ailments are this, if they keep track at all, and the likelihood is that they won't keep track. You know, I mean, it's... I think I completely understand why they don't want to come on the radio show. Although, it's kind of like me with Bernie. Bernie should have stood up and given those people the finger and said, Hey, they threatened to murder my grandchildren and my wife, but you know what? I'm walking out of here. Come on, Jane, let's go and watch those people murder him. I mean, we need to just stand up to these monsters who are unequivocally lying. Okay, so let me get back to what Kim said, because she just spews out, she writes these things on this uh, the Coldwater Creek, just the facts page. It all comes out of her brain because she's living it, and she knows it. She lives and breathes it. She lost a child, a six-year-old child, folks. As stated above, much of the contamination and sediment from the creek was used as fill dirt, fill dirt in homes that were created in the 1950s and 60s. Contaminated radioactive dirt. Now, where else in the country was the radioactive dirt used? That's my question. Back to her comment. The creek was simply the original mode of transport. We believe the first generation of children that grew up in those homes have the highest exposure rate. I do agree with you that emotions run very high, but we do have factually based evidence and we are working with the CDC and ATSDR, which is the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Re Registry. As a generality, we do not claim that every cancer was caused specifically by the creek. Our argument is based upon volume of evidence, in quotes, incidence versus prevalence in public health terms, unquote consensus data and statistics, as well as epidemiological studies. The North County area as a whole has a higher than expected cancer rate. These specific cancers match the 21 identified cancers by the federal government for chronic low-level ionizing radiation exposure. I would encourage you to check out our information on our webpage on our disease maps at coldwatercreeksfacts.com, www.coldwatercreekfacts.com. I'm going to open that link in a different link. As admin of this group, we do take a scientific approach. Between the six of us, we hold multiple graduate degrees in science, economics, mathematics, engineering, and healthcare. Our goal is not to create fear or stir up emotions, but rather to raise health awareness and gain support for inclusion in the Radiation Compensation Act or RECA. That's their goal. Wow. Wow. That hurts my feelings that people would even be willing to live there based on the facts. And I guess, again, that's probably why nobody wants to come on the radio show. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I discovered? This is just so shocking, folks. We are St. Louis. They don't care about us. Hey, everyone, here's this is another quote. In order for the CDC to investigate, there needs to be evidence of a cancer cluster. This was from 2011. This is defined as similar types of cancer in a given period of time. If you, your child, or a loved one who grew up in the area has been affected, please post your name, date of diagnosis, date of cancer, and, and current status. Those, this will help those of us who are trying to build a case. This was May 23, 2011. And here we are, 2016, and they're just now beginning. While people are getting sick. 
And then to find out after speaking with this health physicist from this area, after reaching out to people to please come and be on the radio show, frankly, he has convinced me that the chemical pollution is probably as severe, if not more of a crisis right now, not only in St. Louis, but around the country. I mean, we... We have some very seriously bad things going around our country in almost every major community. And it is the responsibility of the EPA who has been grotesquely negligent. So I've moved on to the Westlake Landfill page. And listen to this. This is what these this is where people in St. Louis and my hat is off to the people in St. Louis because honestly, they are fighting. They are not giving up. Please, this is what it says, July 29th, this was, uh, I guess that was uh, Friday or something, next Wednesday, and what is Wednesday, that is April 3rd, I mean, uh, August 3rd, I believe, find my mouse, um, here we are, just lost my mouse, folks, um, Next Wednesday, please come to Bridgeton Count City Council meeting so the, count so the council has to look us in the eye, E-Y-E, -E, printed big. When they vote to renew Republic's contract, we tried to fight them last meeting by speaking against Republic, but the vote on August 3rd does not look good for Bridgeton. Most of us feel the mayor will continue to let Republic do whatever they want and can do and take as much money for off of Bridgeton as possible, all while poisoning us. Some of us are so mad we could just cry. Some of us are so furious we could puke. Because no one will help us fight Republic. Think about it, please. So this is uh, a plea to the people in St. Louis to please attend the Bridgeton City Council meeting. Because they, can you imagine the City Council of Bridgeton is actually going to renew Republic Services contract? Republic Services, the people who have illegally dumped and caused major problems at the Westlake Landfill. People are dying in West in the in St. Louis because of Republic Services because of their gross negligence, and the City Council is going to renew their license, their contract, and nobody in that city will come out and speak against it. Wow, that is just unbelievably. I don't know. Temporary restraining order. Here's a newspaper article in a uh, temporary restraining order ensures Republic will remain on the job in Flint. They are in Flint, Michigan. Republic Services is in Flint, Michigan. That is the dirty little secret. All these people that Republic Services, all, all these big companies that are poisoning us are in every single community. I mean, it is just unbelievable. And yet we continue to just act like it's no big deal, like, oh, yeah, this is what's happening in Hanford. This is what's happening in St. Louis. Let me tell you what it is everywhere. Um, this is a really long article, the Val Palos Verdes Shelf. This was from the Federal Register from the EPA, Volume 62, Number 162, Thursday, August 21st, 1997, Proposed Rules from the EPA. The Palos Verdes Shelf. From 1947 until 1982, Montrose Chemical Corporation of California, Inc., Montrose, operated a manufacturing facility in Los Angeles for the the production of dichlorodephenyl trichloroethylene DDT, an agricultural pesticide. During this period, Montrose was among the largest producers of DDT in the United States. The reason I'm talking to you about the Palos Verdes shelf, folks, is that is where I grew up. That's I lived right in Redondo Beach up until the year 2000. Redondo Beach, California, which is right below LAX, frankly. it's If you look on the map, Redondo Beach and the Palos Verdes Peninsula, it's like right below LAX. I left there because 
Every time I went for a walk in the water, my feet itched so bad. And if I happened to go swimming, I would get so sick. For three days, I would shake. And I went to the EPA website, and I've talked about this, and I am not over the trauma of discovering it. The EPA has declared the Palos Verde Shelf a contaminated fuse wrap site, and they are not telling anybody. Just exactly like what's happened in St. Louis. If they declare it, and yet they just don't tell anybody that it's there. They don't say anything. They don't tell any of the residents that their exposure might be getting them sick. There was no exposure in the time that I lived there, the 10 years that I lived there. There was no, no conversation. In fact, this is 2016. I left there in 2002. I never even heard of it one time. Not once until I had this conversation with the health physicist from St. Louis who convinced me that the chemical pollution in our country is probably more severe than the nuclear pollution in the immediate term. Long term, probably the nuclear is the worst because it affects our DNA, although many of these chemicals affect our DNA. So this is the plausible deniability that we're living with. I, I honestly, this is where it gets back to. This is really where it gets packed to. This is a, based on the lecture before the Council of the Advancement of Science Writing Briefing on New Horizons in Science. In, excuse me, I'm going to read that again. This is based on a lecture before the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing Briefing on New Horizons in Science in Boulder, Colorado, November 14, 1972. This version for use is, a, is in a series of articles on energy from the Atlantic City Press, July 1973. This is an article that was released for public documentation. This document is public re releasable as of 10-25-2006. They released this document in 2006 and it was 1972 when it was transcribed. So what does that mean? That means what? Let me let me calculate the hours. This just is unbelievable, folks. I can't get over this. 2006, 1973. So the government held it. So the government held it for 33 years. Why would the government want to have this report? This it is a lecture that was given by Dr. Alvin M. Weinberg. He is one of the proponents of nuclear power, and it is called The Safety of Nuclear Power. I'm going to read it to you because this is unbelievable. It's an 18-page report. I'm probably going to come back to it, and I will mark where I stop because on the days when I don't have to speak to people in St. Louis or when I'm not speaking to people in St. Louis, I'm going to pick this mantra up because this kind of propaganda, it tells us exactly why. Kim, who is very educated, says, we do not know that women and children are more susceptible to exposure. That is completely not true, Kim. That is completely not true. You have to parrot that in order to get the government to talk to you. But if you start pulling out Dr. John Goffman's work, they're going to look at you and you are going to have, I understand, you're going to come up against a steel wall. The government doesn't want us to tell the truth. In fact, we have a government that's based on lies, completely based on lies. We now have a Trump-Pence campaign. Pence wants to put gay people in re-education camps. They tried that in China, folks. Re-education camps don't work. This is so outrageous. And then we have an election fraud thief. I mean, we have murderers and thieves running our government, openly running our government. And we have people tiptoeing around begging for help in every corner of our country. And if you don't say the thing right to the Soviet government that we now have, we basically have a Soviet-style government. I mean, that's essentially it, where your vote for the right person only counts. You can, if you don't vote for the right person, your vote doesn't count. And if you say anything wrong, you get hauled off to jail. And if you talk crossways to the police officer or something, you get beaten up or murdered. 
and your body gets thrown God knows where. And your parts are used for scientific research. That's that's the world we live in. It's not fear mongering, folks. It's this is the reality. I'm gonna read you this article because this is when it started. This was nineteen seventy two. He was speaking before a bunch of scientists. Nuclear power plants and their subsystems have caused less damage to human health and to the environment per kilowatt hour than have fossil fuel central power stations. Thus, you know why? <laughs> because there weren't very many in 1972. There was what? The Santa Susana that blew up, nobody told us about. And in this time, this is right around 1970, that this is the type of document that 350.org is relying on. Professor Lave's argument is based on the fact that some 120,000 coal miners today receive about $300 per month compensation as a result of black lung disease. C star M.A. Greenfield and D.F. Hockenneck wrote Nuclear News 1972 have compared radioactive hazard, radioactivity hazard from nuclear power plants with that of oil and coal-fired plants. Their results show that to reach air quality standards for oxides in sulfur and nitrogen and radioactivity in Los Angeles County, one could tolerate 160,000 nuclear plants of a million kilowatts capacity, but only 10 oil-fired or 23 natural gas plants of this size. This is what they have done. This guy was a master deceiver. Do you imagine what he's saying? L.A. County could have tolerated 160,000 nuclear power plants. God forbid we would not have a planet. Granted that, pro granted that properly, and properly is underlined here, Granted that properly operating nuclear power plants and their subsystems, including mining, transport, and chemical reprocessing of used reactor fuel elements, and disposable and disposal of radioactive waste, are benign and have been so demonstrated. There are concerns regarding the possibility that these systems may malfunction and cause hazard to people and to the environment. This is a perfectly legitimate question that deserves serious and thoughtful consideration. And it is this aspect of the matter that I shall address. Great. He's going to tell us about the safety of nuclear power. A properly operating nuclear power plant and its subsystem is and can remain an innocuous, as innocuous as a thermal power plant as man has ever devised. The whole safety issue then centers around the possibility that a nuclear plant or its subsystems may malfunction so grossly as to cause damage to the environment or to the people. Can we say Fukushima, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl? At the onset, we must remember that the technological, that the techno technical community has always recognized that a nuclear system is a potentially underlined potentially a dangerous device. For every kilowatt of electrical power generated there will be the equilibrium in the reactor of 10,000 curies of radioactivity, one curie being the radiation equivalent of one gram of radium. The radioactivity is in the form of various fission products as well as in the liquid fast metal breeder reactors. The liquid fast metal breeder reactors, about 3.5 grams of plutonium 239. New fuel that produced in the breeder is in itself radioactive. A million kilowatt breeder, therefore, has an equilibrium about 10 billion curies of fission product radioactivity as well as 3,500 kilograms of plutonium-239. Wow! Thus we are dealing with highly toxic materials. That despite these potential dangers and potential is underlined, I can assert that nuclear systems per kilowatt hour have caused much less damage to the biosphere than have other sources of thermal energy is a tribute to the ingenuity and foresight of the reactor engineer. From the earliest days of nuclear energy, we nuclear people have constantly been reminded of this potential danger. In 1942, one of the first jobs I did for the Manhattan Project was to estimate the hazard caused by minute amounts of radioactive carbon that would be emitted from the early air-cooled graphite reactors. 
and General Leslie R. Groves insisted that Enrico Fermi move his West Stands critical reactor from the center of Southside Chicago because of the potential hazard. Being so sensitively attuned to this potential, we have developed techniques and methods for handling these materials safely. Really? The question is, successful as we have been in the past, can we say that about the likelihood of our continuing success in the future when large nuclear energy reactors will dot the landscape everywhere? The potential hazard of a nuclear system arises from the toxicity of both the materials that keep the system burning and from the fission product ashes. Plutonium-239 with a half-life, uh, in quotes, the time during which one half of the original material changes by radioactive processes of 24,400 years. Plutonium-239 with a half-life of 24,400 years is lethal to man in doses of about 16 thousandths of a gram if ingested in the lungs. Strontium-90, with a half-life of 30 years, will be lethal if about 70 millionths of a gram is ingested. 70 millionths of a gram is ingested. Iodine-131, with a half-life of 8 days, will be lethal after ingestion of only about, oh my god, 30 billionths of a gram. Iodine-131 with a half-life of 8 days will be lethal after ingestion of only about 30 billionths of a gram, folks. Do you know what that means? Iodine-131, EPA is going to increase the rates. Let me, let me Google that. Hold on. I apologize, but I have got that just... Here we go. EPA radiation limits 2016. This is what it says it's going to do. Raise the radiation limits. What's the number for iodine-131 in the event that we have a nuclear meltdown? What do they say they're going to do? Raise radiation limits from iodine-131 to how much? I mean, 3,300%. Uh, that's what they think they're going to do, the safe levels. In emergency, in case we have a nuclear meltdown, the EPA, oh, actually, I think it actually did. They, they are going to do it. I think they're really going to do it. That is not a proposed guideline. It's actually what they actually did. I don't know if any of you people feel like we have been really betrayed, but I certainly feel betrayed at such a deep level. Such a completely, completely deep level. They want to allow us, this is according to the environmentalists, the new uh, allowable limits would allow iodine, 131 limits to be increased 3,400 times higher than it is now permitted. Strontium-90, there would be a 925% increase. 925% increase, 3,450 times for iodine-131. What did we just read? Strontium-90 with a half-life of 30 days will be lethal if only about 70 millionths of a gram is ingested. And our government is now allowing, if we have a nuclear, and in which, during this situation, they declared Fukushima uh, an emergency, which means right now, I wonder if as soon as this proposed bill gets passed, they are going to increase the radiation limits. And just say, oh, by the way, we do have an emergency. Fukushima is uh, much worse than we thought, and we're in a state of emergency. And don't worry, the radiation limits for uh, this radioactivity is 3,300% higher. Really? That's what they're going to do? It's unconscionable. This is our country's, literally, these government agencies. This, this is, in fact, why some of the people at St. Louis 
are really hesitant to come on the radio with me because I'm not willing to pussyfoot around on this one. They still need the CDC. They still they think they need them. They think this is the this is this is where we're at. We are really a battered cultured folks. Where the people who are being battered need the help of the batterer just to get a drink of fucking water. It's unbelievable. I'm going to get back to Dr. Weinberg, the monster who, who, who sanctioned all of these nuclear power plants, all the nuclear lies. He sanctioned it. But here he is. This article was released in 2006. He gave this speech in 1972. And it was released 33 years afterwards. Why? Because of what he's going to say in this 18-page document, all of which I will not have time to read today. But I'm going to get back to it. Iodine-131 with a half-life of 8 days. So don't worry, folks. 3,000 times above the current limit. It only lasts for 8 days. Will be lethal after ingestion of only about 30 billionths of a gram. 30 billions just that's like less than what's on a pinhead less than what's a drop on a pinhead can go into your body and cause you harm thus the potential hazard lies in the possibility that even small quantities of these materials getting into the biosphere the countermeasures amount to controlling these materials at every stage of the process to prevent any significant amount from entering the biosphere and here we are how many years later? Now, 33 years later, or I guess what, that's 06, 43 years later. The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, is about to raise the limits 3,000 times higher on iodine-131. In 1972, Dr. Alvin Weinberg was stating, iodine-131 with a half-life of eight days will be lethal after ingestion of only about 30 billionths of a gram. Back to the story. The whole nuclear power system involves four subsystems, mining and refining uranium to fuel the reactor, the reactor itself, transport and chemical processing of radioactive materials from the reactor, and waste disposal. What can one say about the safety of each of these subsystems? Mining and refining. There seems to be evidence that uranium miners run a great risk of lung cancer than does the general public. And also, folks, this is my aside, it also causes the Zika virus. It's not the Zika virus. That the uranium mining were all of the Zika virus cases in South America. You know what happened there? Uranium mining started four or five years ago. Back to this story. If a miner smokes, the risk is compounded. Studies by F.E. London, J.K. Wagner, and V.E. Archer of the U.S. Public Health Services suggest that miners who are exposed to 160 working level months, the presently acceptable level, assuming that miners work 40 years at, at four uh, working level months per year, will have an incidence of lung cancer five times higher than does the general public. If the miner works only 25 years at that level, it is not clear that there is a statistically significant increase in lung cancer. Nonetheless, the number of deaths caused by mining of uranium per kilowatt hour is much less than those of mining of coal simply because there are so many fewer miners involved in per kilowatt hour. Wow. Look at the way that he does this. The reactor. There are two quite different potential hazards from a nuclear reactor. First, there are the routine effluent, including tritium, which is a radioactive form of hydrogen, radioactive fission gases from possible leaking fuel elements, radioactive cobalt from corrosive products, etc. Second, there is the question of a major catastrophic accident to a nuclear reactor that might result in an appreciable fraction of radioactive inventory being released into the environment. An appreciable fraction of radioactive inventory, all of it at Fukushima has been released. All of it, 100% in six nuclear facilities. Nuclear Nuclear power plants in Fukushima, all of it, not some of it, all of it. As for the 
first the release of small quantities of radioactivity. This matter was the subject of some controversy a year, a few years ago, as a result of questioning by Dr. John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin at the Lawrence Laboratory, at the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, as to the adequacy of the radiation standards then in force. I shall not go into the merits of their argument, but shall simply state that the current standards are now so low, five percent of the amount we receive from natural sources at the reactor site boundary as to make the whole issue a non-issue. So they just, they just dismiss entirely the negative effects of radiation that John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin. And you notice he did not mention Linus Pauling, who did win a Nobel Peace Prize for his work that low-level ionizing radiation causes negative harm to babies in utero. Wow. In parentheses. By comparison, the added radiation one gets by sleeping adjacent to one's wife, whose body, as everyone's does, contains radioactive potassium, is around 7% of the standard for the re reactor boundary. This is a classic case of balancing benefits versus risk. What a bastard to compare sleeping next to your wife to taking on radioactive potassium. This is the mind that they have done to everybody, which is why now we have a very educated woman who is saying, we do not know that women and children are more susceptible to exposure. Yes, we do, as a matter of a fact. Yes, we do. Read Dr. John Goffman's book. The Health Effects of Low-Level Ionizing Radiation, a scientific book with all the data involved in it. About 900 pages. It's a freaking thick book. It's outrageous. And indeed, nuclear power plants are now designed to meet these very stringent requirements and in fact are doing so. Here's a technological fix that has been completely resolved and has completely resolved the controversy. So this is the controversy. They have tidied it up, tied it in a little bow and said, it's perfectly fine, 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 fine. Don't worry your pretty little head over it. The question of the likelihood of a serious accident is less easily disposed of. As I have said, even during the Manhattan Project, we realize that a nuclear reactor could undergo what is known as an excursion. That is, if too many control rods were removed, the reactor power could surge to dangerous levels. This, however, is not the main worry, for such excursions are inherently self-limiting both in time and magnitude. Rather, the worry is that very high-powered reactor, immediately after the chain reaction has stopped, the fission products at least momentarily continue to generate 7% 7 7 as much energy as is generated during fission operation. This afterheat decays to about 1% in, in an hour. Thus, a, thou, a million kilogram pressurized water reactor, which is producing, say, three times this amount of heat, will immediately after shutdown continue to produce 220,000 kilowatts of heat. This decays to 40,000 kilowatts in about an hour and to 50,000 kilowatts in 24 hours. Thus, a high-powered chain reactor must continue to be cooled down in a, in a, for a considerable time after shutdown if fuel meltdowns are to be avoided, which is what we did not get. It was Edward Teller and the devil who I call the devil. It was Edward Teller who some 25 years ago insisted with great precessence that these, that in these respects nuclear reactors were potentially dangerous and therefore should be subjected to some searching kind of technological scrutiny before they were built. It was on this account that the Advisory Committee of Reactor Safeguards was formed in 1953 with Roger McCullough as the first chairman, and the ACRS has ever since been immensely important in establishing norms of engineering practice that would forever prevent the loss of coolant and other accidents. This is so outrageous. We're on page six, folks. I'm going to bookmark this, and we, I'm going to come back to this one. 
uh, there is a little bit more time on the show because this is an 18-page document that I am going to read, and I'm. I think what I'm going to do is fill in the gaps on Mondays because this this article really fills in the gaps of what happens on how a whole culture is brainwashed. This article was released in 2006. These statements were made in 1973. And as you can hear, we're having Dr. Edward Teller, the murderer, the known murderer, Edward Teller, is being treated as a respected protector of humanity when they knew for a fact that nuclear power and nuclear everything kills everything in its wake. Right now in Fukushima they cannot get a any kind of anything near those reactors. They have no idea what they're doing. We're living we're living in the nuclear disaster. That's what we're doing. Our world is living in a nuclear disaster. And we are being convinced that don't worry. And do you know why we're being told to don't worry? Because the EPA has allowed companies like Montrose Corporation to destroy even the Palos Verdes shelf. So now we have a city full of people in St. Louis who are fighting the government. And their own, their own city council is about to... Re, uh, in, encourage and renew the license for for the Republic Services, the people that are killing them. Let me repeat this. Next Wednesday, that is August 3rd, please come to the Bridgeton City Council meeting. So the city council has to look us in the eye when they vote to renew public's contracts. Republic Services contracts. We tried to fight them last meeting by speaking against Republic, but the vote on August is on August 3rd, and it does not look good for Bridgeton. Most of us feel the mayor will continue to let Bridgeton do whatever they want and can do to make as much money off of Bridgeton, all while poisoning us. Some of us are so mad we could just cry. Some of us are so furious we could puke because no one will help us fight Republic. Think about it, please. This is a person posting on the Westlake Landfill public group. This is what the people in St. Louis have to live with. All the while, here we are in the Northwest, there's a large fire burning towards Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Um, we get fires all the time in the Northwest up here. We have had so many near misses at the Hanford uh, Reservation site. It's unbelievable. And the worst part about Hanford is not just Hanford is a big mess. We have the Columbia Generating Station living right next to it. So if anything really happens there, we are we are seriously going to have a major problem all across the entire country. So... You know, I don't think it's going to take anything. I don't. I. I actually, especially after watching the last two conventions, the Republic convention and the the Democratic convention, I'm pretty much convinced that really they're not going to stop anything. They're not going to do anything at all. They're just going to watch us all drop off like flies and make as much money as they possibly can while they know they're destroying the planet. And they're hoping to God that they can survive the harm that they have caused. That's really what they're doing. There is no regard. Wow. So, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell people when they ask me, why do I continue to do this? Because really, we need to wake our friends awake. We need to get people to understand that it is up to us. I understand the people in St. Louis hesitant to come on this radio show because they need to kiss ass to the government agencies that are going to help them. Even if they walked away from their houses, they deserve to be remediated. If they start dogging the government, they're not going to get a dime. If they say any of the facts that they're talking about, they're not going to get a dime. If they push back against Claire McCaskill or Roy Blunt or any of the state senators, if they do anything, if they say anything, they're walking a tightrope. They're all being blackmailed into silence. 
Our entire country is being blackmailed into silence. Bernie Sanders was blackmailed into silence. He should have been the freaking Pied Piper, grabbed his wife's hand, looked into the camera and into the mirror and said, somebody threatened us. Somebody came to our house and threatened our lives. And you know what? Make them murder us. And walked out of there, give everybody the finger and told them all to get the fuck away from them. And watch them murder somebody. You know what that speaks to? People want peace. I understand that. I grew up in a house full of terror. And I know what that feels like. You will do anything so that you could just go to school, go to work, go to school, and you don't have to worry about somebody, you know, torturing you when you come back home from work or come back home from school because that's what it's about. And that's what this government does to us. We are being tortured on a daily basis and we are being coerced into silence. And it is time for us to stop the silence. I don't know how many people listen to this radio show. We don't really have a good way to tell the demographics. Again, that's intentional. The powers that are running the media do not want us to figure it out. Maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000, maybe 50,000, maybe a million. Who the hell knows? We don't know. What we do know as that our planet is dying at the hands of these people who are pretending like everything is fine, just fine. Dr. Alvin Weinberg, you know, his first sentence and the next sentence I stopped at, the response of the engineer to the knowledge that an uncooled reactor was a dangerous thing went in two directions. First and the most obvious was to build a stout, airtight, pressure containment vessel around every reactor. And the second, perhaps less obvious, was to provide high-powered reactors, what was called active engineered safety features, various backup systems which would spring into action to make certain that in the event the main cooling system failed, there would be ample fire hoses available to prevent the reactor core from melting. Go tell that to the people of Fukushima who are now five years later being forced to move into a dangerous toxic zone. Tell that to the people of St. Louis who are forced to live at the hands of our government in an area where they're being poisoned by dioxide and radioactivity. It is an unconscionable act that we are having to live in. And the reason I come onto this radio show and have not thrown in the towel after doing it for a year is because our people deserve it. Our planet deserves it. It is our responsibility as adults to face the mess that we have created by turning a blind eye to the batterers. It is time to confront them and time to stop them. On Wednesday, I'm going to be speaking with Patty Amino. And she did actually spend 27 years of her life and is still in litigation trying to get remediation for Apollo, Pennsylvania. So this is what they have to, to think about. We have 30 seconds left, and Ackerman is joining us on the group. So I think I'm going to eliminate that. Oh, God. So, look, put your courage feet on, you guys. We have got to take action, and it is up to us to really move through this. And we have to be adults. We have to be responsible. Put more than courage feats on. Take action. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you guys on Monday.